our text is Hebrews 2. We're in the, we've just begun a series a couple weeks ago in the book of Hebrews. We're going to be in this book for most of this year. It is a, a book that is extremely difficult to digest. It's a book that's extremely difficult for us to apply, especially since there's so much differences between the world that they lived in and the world that we live in. But we're looking at a book that was written to a group of believers that had never met Jesus face to face, right? It's very similar to us. They hadn't met the apostles who had met Jesus. They hadn't met Jesus himself. They were a group of people who heard their message. They came to faith in Jesus, and they were very similar to our context. Hopefully, I mean, if you met Jesus face to face, that's awesome. Tell me about it. But most of us in this room have never seen the face of Jesus. Most of us in this room have never heard the voice of Jesus. We've heard the messages through the, um, through the word, and the Holy Spirit began to work in our lives. And the gospel has transformed us, and we're here because we've heard. They're talking to a church that's extremely small, a church of maybe 75 maximum people that's gathering that has been already kicked out of the synagogues because the Jewish folks don't like them. So they're meeting in different homes, maximum 75 people gathering together to worship Jesus, an incredibly small church. They're meeting in a city that's huge. You're talking about Rome, the largest city of the world at that point. People from every part of the world are there. Every religion is there. Every ethnicity is there. Everything is accepted except Christianity. And so you're talking to a group of people, and the theme that the writer of Hebrews keeps emphasizing over and over again is that Jesus is better, better than anything else that's out there in the world. And I'm praying that would be our theme for our lives. It would be our theme for our church, especially for this year, that whatever the world is us to offer, whatever is out there, Jesus is so much better, that it would capture our hearts that Jesus is better than anything. The theme that Jesus is better than anything else in the world than the world has to offer. He's better. He's greater. Already we've seen in when Jason spoke a couple weeks ago that Jesus is the greatest king. He's the greatest prophet. He's the greatest priest. Last week we saw the supremacy of Jesus over the angels and how Jesus is greater than the angels. And what we're looking at this week is that because Jesus is greater and because he's better, he has the right to tell us what to do. And that's a difficult thing for us to understand. It's a lot more fun to talk about angels, right? And whether they have wings or whether they're white or whatever, it's a lot more fun to talk about angels than it is to talk about authority. But we're specifically going to be looking at the authority of Jesus, the one who has ultimate authority, the one who who can command the angels and dispatches them and rules over them. He also rules over the world, which we talked about last week. The Bible says that he has the enemies under his foot. Every other authority in the world pales in comparison to the ultimate authority of Jesus. Everyone else's authority is borrowed or it's delegated. It's important for you to understand that real authority is and what real authority and how you submit to real authority. I say real authority because we've all been under authority that's not real. Someone assumes they have authority because they have a title or a position or because they've been elected to something and they use their authority to manipulate people to do whatever they want them to do. But you contrast that to the authority of Jesus. And we're talking about to submitting to what Jesus has to say. Not necessarily what people interpret him to say. Not necessarily what I'm telling you he says. But we're talking about submitting to the word of God. What does Jesus say? And how do we submit to that? It's important for us to understand that Jesus has given, that Jesus has given in the Bible the authority. And we need to understand and submit to it. If we don't, what happens is we'll break our backs on the, back of, on the rocks of reality. Authority is something we have to submit to if it's real. All of us in this room, we've grown up under authority. Often it was flawed authority. Whether they were our parents or our church leaders or our school teachers or our employers or our government officials, all of us have been under authority that was far less than perfect. Even if you had the greatest parents, they were the best parents in the entire world. There were times where you even experienced them mishandling the authority that God had given them. Even if you yourself are the greatest parents, you're perfect, right? You could raise your kids perfect. There have been times, if you're like me, where you've had to apologize to your kids for abusing your authority or at least bribing them with ice cream for um, abusing your authority um, and reacting to them in anger or in frustration or causing them to fear simply out of the fact that I'm their dad, not because I, I genuinely care or because I didn't get my way, right? 
abuse of authority. Maybe you've learned at a young age, maybe some of you guys are still learning, that when you rebel against authority, it's not going to be good for you in the long run. Some of you can look back and you see how you constantly rebelled against your parents or authority that has been placed over you. And your life was miserable because of it. You're constantly in trouble. You're constantly facing anguish simply because you wouldn't submit to the authority that was over you. There's something inside of us that hates authority. We rebel against it. We would rather be living under our own conditions and hate having other people influence us or dictate the course of our lives. Why do we do that? Why are we like that? Why are we wired like that? Some of you guys are thinking, oh, because we're independent and that's, we love to live carefree and that's the way God's wired us. But the Bible says it's completely different from that. The Bible actually calls it sin nature. It's sinful. It's deep inside of us. It's wired into us and it's wired into our children. There's this selfishness that's in them to rebel and reject authority that is over them. Some of you guys that have kids, you know that even from a young age, before they even start talking, they want to do the very things that you tell them not to do, right? I t- use the illustration, our, our kids, we don't have to teach them what to do wrong, right? They know what to do wrong. They immediately know to punch their sister, punch a sister. You immediately know to lie. You know everything to do wrong. We've got to invest time to teach them what to do right. That's where all of our energy goes is this is the right thing to do. As parents, you get frustrated and you say, what's wrong with you? Why can't you just get it? Why can't you just do it the first time I tell you? Why can't I've told you this 10 times, 20 times. Why can't you do it the first time? So the last person you ever want to ask is your grandparents, right? Because they, all they say is it's payback for all the times that you misbehaved against them. And so that's pointless. But we watch it in our kids, but the reality is we, it's in our own lives. We want what we want, and we want it when we want it. And we don't care, we don't care who we hurt in the process of getting it. We rebel against authority. We don't like people telling us what to do. We feel like our freedom is somewhat being violated. We don't like people over us. There's something in it, in it that ha- we hate, right? We hate it. When someone tells you what to do, there's something that gets irked inside of you, right? Whether it's your wife telling you to put the dishes away or um, make the bed or whatever, there's something inside of you that it irks you when someone tells you what to do. But when we recognize that there is good authority that's over us and that authority is for our good, we actually do well with our lives. Some of you are testimonies of that. Even though you might not have had perfect parents, and they messed up numerous times, they were good authority figures in your life. They wanted to see you succeed. They wanted to see you grow, and they worked tirelessly to make sure that you were provided for, and that you, who you are today is because of their work and effort and authority over your lives. You chose to submit to good authority that God had placed in your life, and you are blessed because of it. Authority isn't a bad thing, right? I mean, there's some things that are good. There are a few laws out there that... It's good that we obey it and respect it. Gravity is one of those things. Um, let's take Daryl, for example. If Daryl on Halloween decides that he wants to be Superman and jump on top of his apartment and jump off, he can do that if he wants to do that. But I guarantee you gravity is going to win that battle, right? He is going to fall. He's going to break his bones. And all of us are going to laugh at him for a long, long time come after. Gravity is going to win. A fish has to submit to water. It can decide that he's tired of water and jump out of water and says that he wants to sit on land, but water is eventually going to win. That fish is going to die. It has to submit to the authority of which it's been placed in. And God has designed each of us as a loving authority who knows what's best for us. And we're called to submit to his authority and follow what he has to say for us for our own good. That's why he does it, for our good. In our passage in Hebrews, we see that God has set up Jesus as king. As king, he has absolute authority over angels, absolutely authority over us. And we'll do well to listen to him. And the writer is implying here in our text that we're following the examples of the angels because the angels submitted to the authority of Jesus, and we're called to do the same, submitting to authority. Some of you are like, you're okay, you're fine, you don't need that. 
I call my own shots. I do my own thing. I'm, I'm okay so far because I've listened to myself. I'm the boss of my own life. I determine what's best for me. I'm de- I decide where I'm headed, and God will bless whatever I do. God's there to bless whatever I lay my hands on, right? I'll listen to my conscience, and that's okay. Some of you guys are like that. Do you know that's dangerous? That's like Pinocchio theology. You guys remember Pinocchio? He listened to Jiminy Cricket, and Jiminy Cricket would tell him, hey, just listen to your conscience, right? That's the motto of serial killers for eternity. That's what serial killers think. Just listen to your conscience. And so it's never a good thing to follow your conscience. It's never a good thing to listen to that little voice in your head. It's not wired right. It's messed up. Sin has affected your conscience. Just because it feels right, just because it looks good, just because it looks appealing, doesn't mean that it's right. Just because you feel like this is great doesn't necessarily mean you're doing the right thing. See, that's why God gives us his word to follow. And as a believer, as a child of God, we can walk with the assurance that Jesus will guide our lives knowing what is best for us. He has the authority. Why does he have the authority? That's what Hebrews 1 is about, the passages that we looked at over the last several weeks. The whole point of Hebrews 1 is that Jesus is God. He has gone through life, lived an absolutely perfect life that we should have lived, died a death that we should have died in our place. He rose again. He ascended back into heaven to a roaring applause of the angels celebrating his victory. He takes a seat on the throne next to God the Father, not as a son anymore, but as king. And we get to submit to his authority. He has power. He has authority. He's God. He can tell us what he wants us to do. But the writer is saying there's so much more than just simply the fact that he has power and authority. It's not the fact that he's simply God and that's why we have to obey him. But there's an implication here that he has earned the right to tell us what to do. He's God. We know that. But he... It's not like he was in a royal family, born into a royal family. He's a prince. He's next in line, and he's just going to be the next king. But he went into battle. He trampled the enemy at the foot of the cross. He rode back into heaven victoriously. The angels applauding his tremendous victory and rightfully takes the throne because he's earned it. He's God. He can tell us whatever he wants to do, and we're supposed to do it. But this God left heaven, came down to earth, conquered death, purchased our salvation, and now is over us as king, and we get the privilege and the responsibility to submit to him as our king. When you look at this church in the book of Hebrews, where the letter is being addressed to, it's important for you to understand that they're facing numerous problems, right? They're facing numerous challenges in this church. We talked about a couple weeks ago, but they were facing some active dangers in their lives. The Roman government hates them and is persecuting them. They're suffering for the sake of the gospel. Their Jewish family and friends have rejected them, and now they're isolated. They're facing active dangers of rejection, isolation, persecution, imprisonment. But there's a danger here that's bigger than active danger. There's a passive danger here. It's going on in the church in Hebrews. It's going on in our church. It's going on in every church around the world that's gathering this morning. The passive danger is even worse than the active danger. The passive danger is the danger of taking Jesus lightly. It's the danger of just ignoring Jesus. Passive danger is yawning at his authority. It's just listening to what he says But because you don't take it seriously, you don't do what he commands. The passive danger is to regulate Jesus to a two-hour time frame on Sunday morning and then to take him for granted for the rest of the week. It's what the writer of Hebrews would call the hardening of our hearts. He'll repeat this theme throughout the book of Hebrews over and over. If you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. He repeats it throughout the letter. There's a reason. Because there's a tendency in all of us, myself included, to do just that. That if we're not careful, that our hearts get hardened toward God. Some of you in this room have very soft hearts. God speaks, you obey, you listen, you're ready to do it no matter what he tells you to do. Some of us in this room, we have hard hearts. Either way, God has a message for you this morning from our text. The writer is calling the church to sit up, listen, and know that they're in dangerous path when we take lightly the authority that Jesus has over us and basically shelf Jesus till Sunday mornings. He doesn't want them to simply blow off the truth. 
He doesn't want them to simply gain a bunch of knowledge, but wants them to see that there is nothing better, absolutely nothing better than submitting to the authority of Jesus. He wants them to understand that they have two options. And Jesus is this whole huge boulder. If you stand behind Jesus, you're safe, you're secure. But if you're standing in front of Jesus, there is this danger that you will be trampled and you will be destroyed. And you have the option of which you choose. Listen, guys, the safest place to ever be is under the authority of Jesus. It's where he is your shield, where he is your protection. We need to listen to what he says. We need to fear what he says. We need to believe what he says. And that's what the writer is going to tell us in our text this morning. And those are the three things we're going to look at. We need to listen to what Jesus has to say. We need to fear what Jesus has to say. And we need to believe what Jesus has to say. Number one, we need to listen to what Jesus has to say. Look at verse one. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. The implication here is that there were some in the church that were already drifting away. There were some in that group that were already moving away from God. They needed to pay closer attention because they had cruise control in their lives. They digested enough truth. They've been in church for a long, long time. They know every story. They know a ton of verses that they can just slow down for a little bit. They know enough information. They know enough facts that they've heard. They neglected the fact that they were men and women under the authority of Jesus. They forgot that, that everything that God has done for them. They forgot that they're not their own. They forgot that a tremendous price has been paid for their salvation. They forgot that God has gone to the extremes to redeem them. His goal, the writer's goal, is to remind them that Jesus is is their king. He didn't just become their king. He has earned the right to become their king, and they need to submit to him. The phrase there, pay much closer attention. The original idea there is turn your mind back and think about something you haven't thought about in a while. That may, and that's maybe what God is calling some of you this morning to do. Maybe you're on cruise control in your walk with God. Maybe you've lost the joy of your salvation. Maybe you lost the awe and wonder of who Jesus is in your life. And today God's saying, turn your mind back. Remember back how you used to love him. Remember back how you used to adore him. Turn your mind back and think about him like you used to before. Get your minds back on him. Go back to Jesus. In our home, I've got it set up where all of my bills are paid up, um, paid through automatic payment, right? It's um, my electric bill is automatic payment. My gas bill is automatic payment. My phone bill is automatic payment. Everything's automatic payment. So I'm on cruise control when it comes to the bills. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to think about it. I see the bills. I open it up. Look, okay, that looks good. Never even think about whether the bill is paying or not. I know on the due date the bill is going to be paid. I don't never think about it. So, But there's one bill for the longest time that I couldn't do recurring payments. It was our city of Rowlett water bill. For the longest time, I couldn't do recurring payments on that. And oftentimes, I'd bunch it in with the other bills. And I'd look at it and say, oh, yeah, I've got to pay this. But I'd forget. And then uh, two weeks before cutoff, I'd get a little notice with bright pink paper that says, warning, cutoff notice. I look at the paper, and I say, oh, yeah, I need to pay that. Often, I do. I remember and pay it. But there's been a time, maybe more, where I forgot. And so we'd come home on like a Tuesday or Wednesday, and we're rushing home from work, and I tell the kids, hey, go take a bath. So they run, they, they change, they jump in the shower, and they turn it on, nothing comes out. Listen, if you're the person responsible for paying the bills in your house, and you forget to do it, and things don't work, your otherwise loving spouse won't be so loving at that moment, right? And it's after five, so this city of Rowlett is closed, and that means we have no water for about an entire day. And so what I've got to do is I've got to price line a room. And so we get a room somewhere near our house. Um, the kids love it because now they've got a hotel room and they get a swimming pool. My wife doesn't like the irony of the fact that the kids are swimming because of the fact that we don't have any water in our house. Um, she doesn't like the fact we spent money. I think it's a nice little staycation away from home. Um, but there's just something about getting that warning and saying, oh, yeah, and ignoring it. Listen, in thinking of Jesus and praying and reading the Bible in your relationship, and you have an oh, yeah statement to it, 
you're in dangerous territory. You're in extremely dangerous territory. If it comes to the Bible and you say, oh yeah, I need to read that, you're in a dangerous territory. If you come to praying and you say, oh yeah, I need to spend some time in prayer, you're in a very dangerous territory. When it comes to going to church and says, oh yeah, I need to go to church today, you're in a dangerous territory. That's a bad place to be. And that's where some of the hearers in this letter are. And that's why the writer is writing to them. The writer is telling them to be concerned about the state of our lives. Pay much closer attention to what you've heard. You've gotten comfortable with Jesus. Let me ask you, are you listening to him? Are you listening to Jesus? Or are you listening to the little voices inside of your head that's only interested in yourself? Or are you listening to those voices of your friends that are only interested in what's good for them, not necessarily what's good for you? Who ultimately do you listen to? There are a ton of people out there that give you good input, right? I'm not saying don't ever listen to anyone else. But there's a deeper question. Are you listening to Jesus? Because he's the only one. He's the one that loves you more than anyone else out there. That includes your parents. That includes your children. That includes your spouse. That includes anyone else there. Jesus loves you more than any of them. Are you listening to him? What he says for you is good. Are you listening? See, the sun could be shining really, really bright out there. But if your eyes are closed, you're not going to see it. You're going to be, bl- you're going to miss it. You need to listen to what he says. Why is this important? What difference does it make? Listen to what the writer says. It says, pay close attention lest you drift away. If you neglect your love for Jesus, if you lose your passion for the things of God, what happens is that you slowly start drifting away. This is one of five serious warnings that the writer of Hebrews gives in this book. You'll see four other times that he gives a very serious warning in the book. Strong warnings. The idea here is the idea of a boat that's at sea. The anchor was there, but the anchor's been reeled up or the anchor's been broken. And nothing, the boat wasn't being um, driven over to sea, but slowly over time, as the winds came, as the waves came, it started drifting away, drifting away. That's the imagery of our text here. If you aren't paying close attention to your love for Jesus, you're in danger of drifting away from the safe harbor of his safety. There are two groups of people that the writer of Hebrews is addressing. The first group are people that truly love God, that want to do what God tells them to do. But over time, they've got stagnant in their walk with him. They've grown cold and they just slowly started drifting, slowly started moving away. The second group is a group that's almost Christians. They hang around with other believers. They show up, but they've never fully committed to God. They never put their anchor down. They never said, I am following Jesus because he's greater than everything. He's better than everything. They're in and out. They're here some weeks. They're gone some weeks. They're not fully committed to Jesus. And he's warning them that if they don't respond soon, they will drift away out into the world, and that world is hell. In this church, this group started to distance themselves from the church, no longer publicly identifying themselves with the church anymore. Slowly but surely, they lost all contact and drifted away. And this is important for us to understand. The idea behind the verse is that to drift from Jesus is easy. It's an easy thing to drift away from Jesus. It's usually never intentional. I've never met someone that said, I'm just rejecting God. It starts slow. It starts bits by bits, and they start drifting away from him. And it usually happens because of inactiveness, inattentiveness, or carelessness. There's no neutral with Jesus, is there? You're either moving forward with him, or you're moving back. You kid yourself to think that you are okay where you're at. You're not. Listen, write this down if you want to write this down. All you need to do is nothing. To drift away from Jesus. That's all you need to do. Nothing. That's the warning that the writer is giving. And I've seen this pattern over and over in the years of ministry. There's a phrase that I hear, and maybe you've said it, maybe you've heard it. The idea that I can be a strong Christian and not be in community and not be in the church. Where I can have a good, I can be good with my relationship with Jesus without ever investing in the local church. Or Jesus is great, but the people of the church suck, right? Let's be honest. 
You can be a follower of Jesus without ever investing or being committed to a church, but you're not going to be a good Christian at all. And you're slowly going to get drifted away and away, and pretty soon you're going to realize you're far from Jesus. What's happening in this church is that people who used to come to church consistently stopped paying care for attention to the teachings of Jesus. They either got caught up in the world that was around them, or they started nitpicking about everything that was going on internally. And the result was that instead of being an active, vibrant member of the church that was encouraging one another, that was there to push others to love Jesus more and serve, and serving because they love Jesus, they started showing up when it was convenient for them. They became inconsistent in showing up. Eventually, what happened was they stopped showing up completely. They started believing the lie that Jesus is okay with them not being part of the local body, not having the local body invested in them. And eventually other voices began influencing their lives. And before they knew, they had drifted away so far that they couldn't find their way back. They forgot that Jesus had designed the church as the place of harbor for us in the world that we live in. Listen, if you neglect the harbor of Jesus, if you neglect the anchor of Jesus, you're slowly going to start drifting away. It will start with a sense of apathy then you'll simply go through the motions of familiarity, of simply doing the things that you always do. Then it's going to be inconsistency. Then it's going to be compromise. Then it's going to be excuses. And eventually you'll look back and you'll realize that how far you've drifted away from him. And you have no idea how you did it. But it starts small. That's the danger that he's warning these people of. You've got to think about yourself today. Don't think about the people around you. Don't think about your friends. Don't think about your family members. This is for you. This is for me. That... We all drift as Christians. The only way we can keep our anchor down is to have the gospel rehearsed to us over and over every week. I am a great sinner. He is a great savior. I need him. I need people. I need to be in community because I will screw this up by myself if I'm alone. I need people around me. Every week we close our service, bringing you back to the table to remind you that this is not what you've done, but this is all about what Jesus has done. This is why a communion is a huge emphasis for us, because we have to remind ourselves. I've got to remind myself that it's not about how good I do or how bad I do. This is about what Jesus has done. It's about how good he is, how great he is. And I've got to constantly remind myself that he is a great God. I'm a great sinner. Most people don't deliberately reject Jesus and run off. You just slowly start drifting away. Start slowly and you end up in the sea of destruction. C.S. Lewis, C.S. Lewis one of the greatest theologians, said that if he interviewed 100 people that have left their faith, I wonder how many of them have been argued out of it by honest argument or reason. Do you know how most people just simply drift away? They don't find anything wrong with their faith or their theology. They just start nitpicking on little things and they just start slowly moving, moving, and they're out. How many people are in hell that were so close to salvation? I'd say most of them. They drifted away and drifted away and never looked back. Today, if you hear your, his voice, don't harden your heart. Drop anchor. Get grounded in Jesus. The second thing, fear what Jesus says. You got to listen to what he says. You got to fear what he says. Look at verse 2. For since the message declared by the angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or obe- disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation. Here's a great verse. What's he saying? The writer is saying, look at the Old Testament. Think about how the law was delivered to them. The Bible indicates in numerous passages that angels were there to communicate and convey the law from God to Moses. Stephen alludes to this in his message right before he was martyred. The writer is reminding the readers that the law was given through the angels and carried some heavy weight because God was speaking through the law and it was important for the people to listen. How important was it for the people to listen? Look at the Old Testament. What happened when they disobeyed? The judgment of God would fall on them. They would immediately see the consequences of their disobedience. Sometimes it was God supernaturally showing up and wiping off an entire group of people that rebelled against him. Oftentimes it was through the law and the government officials that were there, but God never took sin lightly. Sometimes punishment came directly from him. Sometimes it was through legal processes. Either way, it was swift, it was severe. Read the Old Testament. You see a God of judgment there. There were no debates. There was no trials. There was no juries. There was no caveats. There were no footnotes to the law. If you broke it, the law would break you. 
Nothing was ignored. Nothing was swept under the rug. Everything was dealt with immediately. That was the law of God. This has not changed. Many people think that we're in a New Testament area of grace and God ignores our sin. It hasn't. God still takes sin seriously. He is how serious? More seriously than he did in the Old Testament. Because God deals with sin so seriously now that he actually sends his son to die for our sins. He didn't require animal sacrifices. He doesn't require a goat to die or a lamb to die. He now sends his son to die. That's how seriously he takes sin. The writer is saying to this church, if this is how serious God takes his word that was conveyed to people through angels, how much more serious do you think God is going to take it when he conveys it to you through his son? Do you see the argument here? If God was serious when angels were communicating the message, how much more serious is he going to be when it's now being communicated to us through Jesus? We're under some serious accountability here. Notice the passage. Angels brought the message from God, but Jesus brought salvation. To neglect that, to neglect salvation, is of greater consequence than to break a law. To reject the salvation that Jesus offers is of much greater consequence than you lying to your parents or stealing something. To neglect the king is a completely different ballgame. Jesus says that greater judgment will come to those who hear and listen the word of God and don't respond to it. You'll see this repeated throughout the book. The more you know, the more accountable you are. So if you're a good sermon listener, if you come every week and you take a lot of notes and you fill your head with a bunch of knowledge, if you're a good scripture memorizer and you've got thousands of verses memorized, if that's you but you've never responded to the gospel and the gospel never changes you and your life is not different because you know the truths of scripture, there's a warning for you here. There's a huge warning for you here. And you need to be mindful of it. If the truth doesn't transform who you are, understand that God judges more severely those who hear and listen and don't respond to it. If you haven't manned up in your faith, it's time for you to step up and Believe and do what God is calling you to do. What you know should be distributed to other people. What God has given you should be shared with other people. What he says in his word, you need to respond to it. For example, when he says abstain from sexual immorality, that's exactly what he means. No compromise. That means, guys, stop looking at porn. You don't need to be doing it because God tells you not to do it. Stop daydreaming about the girl that isn't your wife. Stop sleeping with your boyfriend or your girlfriend. When he says flee idolatry, that's exactly what he means. Stop idolizing your job. Stop idolizing your possessions. Stop idolizing your children. Stop idolizing food. Food's good. When he says do everything without arguing or complaining, that's exactly what he means. Stop being argumentative. Stop always getting into fights for the sake of getting into fights. It means stop complaining for what you don't have and be thankful for what you do have. When he says, in everything give thanks, that's exactly what he means. That means, God, thank you today that I am been saved by your grace. My situation could be horrible, but thank you that you've given me another day. In everything give thanks. So many of us, including myself, hear God say and say, oh yeah, I need to do that. And then we ignore it. And the Bible says there's a serious danger behind it. Look at verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Do you see why we have to listen and fear? Because he offers us such a great salvation. He accomplishes something great for us. I said earlier, we're great sinners. He's a great savior. He's offering to forgive and receive anyone and everyone. To see that, to hear that, and to take it for granted is the ultimate refusal of God. What the writer is saying, it's more severe to sin against love than it is to sin against law. It's more severe to ignore God's mercy that is when it's being offered to you than it is for you to break a law of conduct. It's more severe to trample under your feet the blood of Jesus 
than it is to trifle with his commands. He is offering salvation and forgiveness. And if you ignore that, that's worse than if you committed adultery. Listen, but there's hope in this text. There's incredible hope in that verse. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, how can we escape if we committed such a great sin, right? That's not what he says. He doesn't say, you've committed such a big sin that now you're not going to escape judgment. He's saying, how can you escape if you ignore such a great salvation? Do you hear the hope in that? What we believe as a church is that no matter how great your sin is, no matter what you've done, no matter how bad your life is, you can never outrun the grace of God. You can never outrun who God is in your life. At any moment, you can turn to Jesus and he will accept you, he will forgive you, and he will give you a new name. It's not that if you've committed a great sin, you don't have to work your way back to him. You don't have to earn your salvation. You don't have to jump through a hoop to get in. No penance needed. You don't have to go to a priest for him to forgive you. You don't need to pray to some dead saint. You just need to turn back to your Savior and say, Savior, forgive me. Some of you in this room think you've got to change yourself up and you've got to be spotless in order for God to accept you. And what God's saying to you this morning is, I will accept you no matter what your condition. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what your experience. I am a great Savior. To neglect that is worse than breaking any law that you've ever broken. Number three, believe what Jesus says. So now the writer is anticipating the objections of Jesus, and I'm taking a little bit longer, but you've got to forgive me. Or you're breaking the law. Um, the objection is simple. Why should I listen and fear Jesus? Why should I even accept his message? The writer gives evidence of why we need to do this. Remember, these guys are just like us. They never saw Jesus. They never experienced him face to face. In fact, they never saw the apostles that had slain Jesus. These were second generation believers that were worshiping Jesus simply because they believed the message that someone had told them. What are the evidences that he gives? Look at verse 3. It was declared at first by the Lord. It has been attested to us by those who have heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts the Holy Spirit distributed, distributed according to his will. And he gives three evidences of why you should believe Jesus. Number one, the person of Jesus. This great salvation was proven to us by Jesus himself. He spoke of it. He himself is the proof that he is authentic. How is that? Because he gives us no other option than to believe what he said. Think about how radical Jesus is. He gives us no other options. He doesn't leave any options open for us. He chooses the cross when he could have had power. He became a suffering servant when he could have been a conquering king. He washes the feet of disciples when he could have had mighty men kneeling before him. He came to serve when he could have subjected all of us to bow before him. He spoke with silent authority. He was always in control of every situation. He was never surprised or rattled. The quality of his work was outstanding. If he was interested in power, why didn't he proclaim loudly to the world that he was God? Why didn't he try to accumulate the masses to follow him? And he didn't. In fact, often he would flee the crowds to be in isolation. Instead of being in the big city and the palaces, you'd find him walking in rural areas, visiting with people that were sick, poor, outcast, rejected by society. He's healing them. It doesn't make sense at all. I'm hearing myself. Everything he said, everything he said left people speechless. There hasn't been a book written yet that talks about all the things that Jesus should have said or things that Jesus should have done. He always did exactly what he should have done. He leaves us with no choice but to follow him. He leaves no other options. The second proof is the proof of the witnesses. The writer is saying that he doesn't make this stuff up. I've got witnesses that sees these things. Not one, not two, but numerous witnesses. And now I'm telling you. These witnesses were a bunch of interesting people. If Jesus had hired a marketing firm to promote himself, these would not be the guys that you would hire to promote your materials. A typical prayer for a Jewish man, I've said this before, a Jewish man would pray the following prayer almost on a daily basis. God, thank you that I'm not a Gentile, 
that I'm not a slave, that I'm not a woman. That was the prayer of their times. That was their culture. But think about the witnesses that Jesus of the resurrection. Who did first saw him? It was a woman that was used to be bound by demons. It was a Roman centurion at the foot of the cross that said, surely this was the Son of God. These were the witnesses that Jesus offered. No one was going to believe the resurrection with these kind of witnesses. Think about it. The belief in the resurrection is what what caused these guys to be willing to give up their lives for Jesus. None of them would have died if Jesus was simply a good man. But because they had believed that he rose from the dead, they were ridiculed, persecuted, martyred for their faith. They never compromised on that message. They knew Jesus was their king. They were under his authority, and they saw, and they had to say what they saw. They were transformed from cowards to heroes. Not a single one of these guys would ever recant of their belief in the resurrection. They were all under, their author- under the authority of Jesus, and they all shared in the sufferings of Jesus. Think about the disciples. Matthew was killed by the sword. Mark was dragged through the streets of Alexandria on a chariot, dragging him with the chariot. Luke would be hung off of an olive tree in Greece. John was permanently scarred by, by them throwing him into a large pot of oil, and they couldn't kill him, so they exiled him to an island to die by himself. Peter would be crucified upside down. James, the brother of Jesus, would be beheaded in Jerusalem. <coughs> James, the apostle, would be thrown from a high pinnacle, beaten to death. Philip would be hung. Bartholomew would be beaten till he dies. Andrew would be bound to a cross till he dies. Thomas would be run through by spears. Jude would be killed by an execution of arrows. Matthias was stoned and beheaded. Stephen was stoned. Paul was beheaded. Every single one of them dies a brutal death because they wouldn't recant what they saw and what they believed. I don't know about you, but I'm going to believe the witnesses of people that were willing to get their throats cut because of their love and devotion for Jesus. I'll buy that. I'll buy it. And if it wasn't one or two, maybe they were lunatic. But the fact that so many would willingly give their lives for the proof of the resurrection, I'll believe that. Number three, the point of the miracles. The writer adds that we should believe this message, not because he said it, not because the witnesses saw it, but because God validates it through miracles. God sends the Holy Spirit to radically change the lives of these poor and homeless men that were following Jesus around. The Holy Spirit empowers them, and mighty miracles begin to happen through them. What difference does it make? What difference does miracles make? We see many false false teachers out there doing miracles today and putting on a big show and gathering a huge crowd and gathering a lot of attention. Here's where you missed the point. What Jesus and the apostles and the early church did when they did miracles, it wasn't for a show. They weren't trying to draw people in to make themselves look famous. If it was for a show, Jesus should have done a lot more miracles, right? He could have done much more spectacular miracles. He could have easily convinced the people of his time that he was God simply by doing miracles. But what was his miracles about? What was the nature of them? All of his miracles were restorative in nature. He made eyes see. He made the lame walk. He made minds be sane again. He made the deaf hear. This is what they did. They were healing people, restoring them back again. The point of all of this is basically to communicate that the kingdom of God has come. That was the point. Jesus would tell his disciples, go, proclaim that the kingdom is here. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. The point of the miracles back then and now is to proclaim that the king has come, that the king is here. The one who has come to make all wrongs right. The miracles are to verify that. They are a taste of what he is going to do when he comes back. He is going to restore all things and make everything new again. It was the custom of that time for kings to have messengers go before him and declare the king is coming. The king is coming. 
And so the people would be ready and anticipating the king to come. And when the king arrived, they would bow before the king. The miracles are those announcements. God is doing incredible things supernaturally around the world. He's healing sick people. There are parts of the world where the dead are being raised today. Lepers are being cleansed. Lame men are walking. He's not doing miracles simply so that people can be happy. These miracles are a message. The king is coming. The kingdom of God is at hand. He is on his way. These miracles are messages that the king has come. The kingdom of God is upon us. We have witnessed it. We have experienced it. Think about it. What do we do when kings come? Do we all bow to him? What did we do when Jesus came? Did we bow to him? We didn't, did we? We mocked him. We laughed at him. We beat him. We crucified him. How will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation when it has been offered to us after what we have done to him? It will not go well for us if we continue to ignore him. He is our king. The greatest irony here is that even though we killed him, he goes and purchases salvation for us rose again and he's coming back dressed in white in royalty as the king of kings and the lord of lords I'm going to call you this morning to a point of decision you're on the sea of life there are a lot of voices there's a lot of winds and waves that are pushing at you are you anchored in Jesus or are you slowly drifting away do you find your safety and security in him? Or are you finding it somewhere else? We're about to come to the communion table and the table speaks volumes to us that no matter how bad we were, no matter what things we've done, no matter how screwed up we are, there is a God that loves us more than we could ever imagine. Loves us enough that he himself would die in our place so that we could have what we don't deserve which is the relationship with him which is eternity with him this morning would you examine your hearts are you on cruise control are you going through the motions simply because you're going through the motions have you lost your all in wonder of what God has done for you Does the gospel even resonate inside of you anymore? When you hear, oh, he died for me, is that just the same message over and over? Does that capture your heart? Are you drifting? It's a strong warning. And it's an incredible warning for us that we never should lose our love for Jesus. That he is the safest place where we can abide that it is under his authority that we will find everything our hearts long for. But when we drift away, we destroy ourselves. As you examine your hearts this morning, as you examine your lives this morning, if there are areas where you need to repent, would you repent? Would you come to the table not saying, God, I'll be better or I'll do right, but would you come to the table and say, God, thank you that despite myself, you have shown unending love and mercy to me. And the only thing I can do is to respond in worship and gratitude for your grace and your mercy in my life. Father, this morning, would your Holy Spirit speak to us? Would you cause us to come to a point of repentance if we're drifting? Would you help us to put our anchor down in Jesus? Would you help us never to lose our awe and wonder of our Savior. We love you. It's in Jesus' name.